with you. The mystery of God's ways is sometimes hidden from the wise and intelligence. Jesus associates with those often excluded from the religious community. Like Paul, we struggle with our own selfish desires and seek God's mercy and forgiveness. We gather to be refreshed by God's invitation. Come to me, all you that are weary, gathered around word, water, and meal, we find rest for our souls. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 16. But what do, will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We play the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things that have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be, please be seated. Welcome, and happy 244th birthday, America. We are now a mighty nation of 328.2 million people strong. We've gone from riding a horse and buggy to the space shuttle, from the feather pen and an ink well to a touchscreen voice activated computer. What a journey it has been. Our ancestors arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 and on November 11, 1620, the Mayflower anchored in what we know as Providence Town Harbor, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. 102 hardy souls, many seeking relief from religious persecution, gave thanks to God for safe passage and began the long, sometimes very challenging journey in the New World. In Jean Sibelius's hymn, This Is Our Song, she sums up their feeling and ours today. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. We are now 50 states strong, diverse, and independent. However, once again, we are at a crossroads. Together and individually, we must create a new vision, one more equal, more inclusive, and kind toward all of our fellow citizens and those who might visit our shores. We must continue to push forward just as our ancestors did and with God as our moral guide. Like biblical times, War was an early part of our history. The American Revolution began in 1775 and finally ended in victory in 1783. The 13 colonies were no longer controlled by Great Britain and subject to taxation without representation. 
Our founding fathers realized that a strong central or federal government was needed to successfully establish the one United States of America. Out of dark days of sacrifice, grief, and anxiety rose the document that is the cornerstone of our republic. In the summer of 1776, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston gathered together to find the 13, how the 13 colonies could establish a government totally independent of itself. Imagine the intensity in that room. Imagine the courage of the Committee of Five had to muster to take the first step in creating the form of government we still know this very day. A constitution that Thomas Jefferson, with the aid of a few drinks from his colleague John Adams, wrote in 17 days. Imagine the excitement of the 56 delegates who signed it. And one of those was a woman, Mary Catherine Goddard. John Hancock told Congress that we must all hang together. And Ben Franklin replied, yes, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. Thomas Jefferson's words still ring in our hearts today. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. E pluribus unum, translated from Latin, out of many one, was proposed for the seal of the United States. Out of many one offers a strong statement of our American determination to form a single nation from a collection of states. It appeared on our currency until 1956 when the 84th Congress passed legislation and changed our motto to, in God, we trust. Notably, the body of the federal constitution does not make reference to God as such, but does use the phrase, the year of our Lord in Article 7. That being the article where the document sets the number of state ratifications needed for the constitution to take effect and the method by which the states may ratify it. Interestingly, the preamble to our Constitution does not mention God or religion either. It serves solely as an introduction and does not assign powers to the federal government, nor does it provide specific limitation on our government's actions. It sets the spirit of the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. To ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Still today, our courts find it useful in identifying the spirit of our Constitution. We must admit to ourselves that the spirit of modern society has changed over the last couple centuries, and sometimes the historical understanding of this document is in tension with the changed attitude and practices of our more modern society. These changes have prompted our Supreme Court to make a special set of construction and principles for interpreting it. For example, the court's rendering of the purposes behind the Constitution 
have led them to express a preference for broad interpretation of our freedoms. So, how do we as citizens of this republic, Christians, and specifically Lutherans, wrestle with the changing attitudes and practices of 2020? What does the Bible direct us to do? Should we try to turn back the clock? Is it even possible to turn it back? I think most would agree that no, we can't turn the clock back, and why would we want to? Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is not promised. Life is short. As children of the Heavenly Father, life on earth is just a dress rehearsal for our eternal life with Him. Every minute of every day is either spent or it's invested. It is our choice to make. God has asked that we surrender every part of our being to him as he wholeheartedly pursues his plan for us. Nothing that touches our lives, good or bad, happens without first passing through his hands and with his permission. We are God with skin on, sent to accomplish his mission, to witness to a world divided racially, politically, socially, and economically. Today, he wants us to be truthful with ourselves. He wants us to love one another as ourselves. He asks for us to be free in him. Only when we love ourselves wholly and without inner judgment are we then able to love others more wholly and without judgment. He wants us to reach out to others and be of help wherever and whenever we can. He wants us to share the freedom he has given us with others. As humans, we're imperfect. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, there's a crack in everything God has made. How do we use these uncertainties, inadequacies, and lack of control to free ourselves to become the spiritual being that we were truly meant to be? We must first acknowledge our sins, our imperfections, we must accept them as the foundation for our healing. This is the acceptance that sets us free to see a life where our own perfections can be endured as well as those of others. So rather than blame the nations, religions, groups, and institutions for the evil that we see in the world, we must look rather to ourselves to receive the realities of our own limitations. Come to me, all you that are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. This is God's promise of freedom for me and for you. I acknowledge my limitations to myself and to him by praying for courage and strength to carry out God's direction for me, I can then be of service to others. Where is the dwelling of God? This was the question a learned rabbi surprised of, of a number of men who happened to be visiting with him. They laughed at him. What a thing to ask! Is not the whole world full of his glory? And then he answered, God dwells wherever man lets him in. In a country divided and suffering, we must recognize our own limitations as the source of our healing. We must take steps to connect with God and to let him in, to free ourselves and do his will as service to our fellow man. 
God wants us to be truthful with ourselves. Am I living for myself or am I living for Christ? He wants me and you to tell others about him today. He wants us to search for ways to help those in need today. God realizes that we cannot do it all, but we can certainly find all that he has for us to do and focus on that. Christ does not want us to live as if our life will continue forever. It won't. We need to make every day count. We cannot procrastinate. However, we view, how we view life depends on the backdrop on which we live. The drop, drop, excuse me, backdrop for us as believers should be a manger, a cruel cross, an empty tomb, and eternity. Martin Luther King left us with this message. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In today's world, how do we replace anger and bitterness with logic and reason, prejudice and mistrust with love and respect, silence with action. Yes, God is with us even when it really, really hurts. We must pray unceasingly and ask our Almighty God for help and guidance. We must not be afraid to share Christ with the world. And this can be a tough one for Lutherans, myself included. We hear the word evangelism and think of knocking on doors and we have a tendency to run the other direction. Above all, each and every one of us must be kind, gentle, patient, and compassionate. Today is a time of great uncertainty for America. We don't know exactly where the Lord is leading us yet, but this we do know. Jonah was swallowed by a whale, spit out onto land three days later, and became an incredible evangelist. Peter denied Christ three times and sold his life for 40 pieces of silver. But God forgave him over and over and reaffirmed his place in the family of Christ. I feel confident, and so should you, that God has a plan for each of us, and we need to watch, listen for his voice, which is calling you and I to action. It's our nation's birthday. May our patriotism shine for the world to see, united as one. May our love and devotion for our native land and each other grow more deeply and include all who call the United States of America home. Things aren't perfect by any means. Much work is left to be done. Let us all join our hands and hearts in striving for truth and justice for our homeland and for our world. In you, God, is our trust. Yes, our masterpiece is a work in progress today, July 5th, 2020. Amen. <laughs>